The culture of the saints is so supernatural that in order to fit in, you have to do signs and wonders and miracles. Church, we are invited to encounter God in the spirit realm. Well, that happens to everybody. Doesn't that happen to everybody? <laughs> Doesn't everybody know when a bomb's gonna go off? Doesn't everybody know when a, there's gonna be somebody shot dead? You need to start praying in tongues 30 minutes a day, hour a day, however much you can a day. And you'll see things change in your life. If you're not hearing God's voice, maybe we need to stop speaking. As soon as you have faith in your heart and you get close to God, God is gonna drop dreams inside of you. Our God wants relationship, and for Him to have a relationship, He has to communicate. And to communicate, we have to be able to hear His voice. Everybody, every generation can prophesy. It's part of God's great gifting to us through the Holy Spirit. Hello everyone, welcome to Long for Truth. My name is Daniel Long. Pastors and teachers are putting heavy burdens on their people. They are causing them to chase after God via signs and wonders. If they're not performing signs and wonders, some say, well, they're not even living the Christian life. This is a huge issue. And a huge problem because I know firsthand what it feels like to kind of be on that hamster wheel, always trying to do something to make God like me or to assure myself that I was actually hearing from God or that I was in God's good grace or that God was actually working in my life. I actually uh, was saved in a Baptist church, and yet I was taught that God speaks not just through his word, but through prayer, through that still small voice, and even through signs. I can remember one time when I was thinking of moving. And it was to South Carolina. And I'm praying, Lord, how do I know? How do I know? I really want to know. Do you want me to go to South Carolina? And I was at a stoplight and a car pulled right up in front of me that had South Carolina license plates on it. And I thought, there we go. There, there's, my, there's my sign. Um, I went through the Experiencing God book with my church, Baptist church, several times. Um, and... I was taught that if God didn't always answer yes when you prayed for something, then there is either something wrong with you or there was something wrong with God. And you better believe there's not something wrong with God. It's either one of two things, I was told. It's either you have sin in your life that's not confessed or you're not saved. And I was constantly looking for assurance and I was looking for it through God acting outside of Scripture. I treated the Bible like an eight ball. You ever seen one of those eight balls that you shake up, you ask it a question, you shake it up, and then it gives you the little answer there at the top? That's what I would do with the Bible. I would have to make a decision about something, and I would pray and then pop the Scriptures open. Or I would have maybe fallen into a, a sin and wondering if God had forgiven me, and I would open up the Bible and hope to see that God was saying, yes, I forgave you, rather than looking to Christ for my assurance. So being on that hamster wheel of always chasing after some kind of sign to know for, fa for a fact that God loves you, that is a very stressful, difficult way to live. It's how I lived, and it's how a lot of charismatics right now are living because they are being taught to chase after this stuff. Here's an example from Haley Braun. And I'm sitting in the airport reading this, thinking nothing of it, and I start encountering the Holy Spirit. 
And God starts speaking to me and I pull out my journal and a pen and I start writing about a great awakening that's coming to sweep America and the nations. And as I'm writing about this great awakening, I get caught up in the spirit and I, I've, I come out of what feels like my physical body and I'm taken into the throne room of God. If that's a bit of a stretch for your imagination, it was for mine too. It wasn't my imagination. It wasn't something I dreamed or thought up. It's not something that happens to me all the time. I don't want to inflate or make it sound bigger. It was a moment that shaped me. But it says in Ephesians 2 that we are seated in heavenly places. Paul says that we are hidden in Christ and seated in heavenly places. In Revelation 4, the Spirit of God invites John to come up here. John who was on the Mount of Transfiguration, John who saw miracles, signs and wonders, John who experienced wild spiritual experiences was still invited into reality that he knew he was in but was not always experiencing. Church, we are invited to encounter God in the spirit realm. I feel like there's been a, a, a handicap on the church in this season. I'm pointing to my hamstring, like we've been hamstrung in the spirit to focus on that which is the natural. And the Lord is inviting us to see from His perspective. One thing to notice about charismatic leaders, teachers, pastors, is how many times they like to put themselves into the narrative or how many times they say, I, I did this, I did that. I, this happened to me. God moved me up in the spirit, lifted me up in the spirit realm to heaven or whatever. If your pastor or your teacher or your favorite YouTuber is constantly elevating themselves to show how great they are and how all of these great and wonderful experiences they've had, then there's a huge problem. Also, she mentions that uh, in, in the uh, a passage in Ephesians chapter 2, where it says that we are seated with him in the heavenly places. And she does that to validate her experience. But that is not what that passage is talking about. So let's read it in context. This is what it says. Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the, saint, in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So this is not speaking about God inviting us up into the heavens or into uh, heaven itself like he did the Apostle John. That's not what that passage is talking about. This passage is speaking of the glorious riches that we have in Christ. It's actually speaking of our salvation. It's a salvation passage. It has nothing to do with having an um, encounter in the sense that you are being taken into the spiritual realms. Um, there's some good connections to this verse. Um, Colossians 2.12 says, Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. Colossians 3.1 If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. So this is our position in Christ. That's what this passage is talking about. We have been saved by grace through faith apart from works, God sees us now as perfectly righteous because we have Christ's righteousness imputed 
to us, credited to our account. So he sees us as if we are actually already there. So it's kind of a um, now, not yet situation. Yeah, we're there, but we're not there yet. You know what I mean? So it's a now, not yet situation. In God's mind, we're there and we will be there. But this is the beauty of our salvation. This is the beauty of how God sees us now because of Christ and his righteousness being given to us, credited to us. Now we are seated with him in the heavenly places. So that is not talking about uh, God inviting us up to heaven. She also says the spirit of God invites John to come up here, implying that like John, we can do the same. You know, God is inviting us up here too, up to heaven as well, to have these wonderful experiences, right? Well, folks, John was an apostle. John was about to write down what he saw for the entire church. As a matter of fact, John writes uh, in Revelation 21 that he did write. <laughs> he says in Revelation 21, 5, And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also, he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. So John was there for a specific reason. That is to, to, to write down what he saw and to give this to the entire church throughout the ages. This has nothing to do with an, a spiritual experience that we can all have as Christians. So John wasn't called up to heaven for the purpose of a wonderful heavenly experience. But, according to Haley and the folks at Bethel, every single Christian should be pursuing a life of signs and wonders. And nowhere does the Bible say for us to do that. Here's another teacher at Bethel. Check this clip out. How would you slip in if you wanted to deceive the sheep? You would have to be able to do what they do. Otherwise, people would go, you must be a demon. You can't do signs and wonders and miracles. In other words, the culture of the saints is so supernatural that in order to fit in, you have to do signs and wonders and miracles. That's why people think you're a believer because you're doing what the sheep do, and yet you're a wolf. That's the culture. See, he would, they would fool even the elect. Why? Because everyone's doing signs and wonders. They're all wearing the sheep clothes. What do sheep do? These are the signs of those who believe. These signs will follow those who believe. They'll cast out demons. They'll heal the sick. They'll lay hands on, on, on the sick and they shall recover. And they'll deadly poisons. This is the signs of people who believe. These are what believers look like. So if I wanted to come in and deceive you, I'd have to be able to do what you do. Otherwise, it would be a lot easier for Jesus to say, false prophets are people who can't do signs and wonders. You'll know them because they, they, they stick out in the crowd because they can't, do, they can't do miracles. But instead he says they have power. Like, it looks like your power, but guess where the anointing's coming from? Valentin says the culture of the saints is so supernatural that in order for you to fit in, you have to do signs and wonders. Is that a heavy burden or is that not a heavy burden? So if you're a true saint, if you're a genuine saint, you should be walking in signs and wonders. And if you are not, think of the implications of that. If you're not, you're not a genuine believer. And yet we find plenty of incidents in the book of Acts where genuine believers are not operating in signs and wonders. Uh, for example, Acts chapter 9 says this, Now there was in Joppa a disciple named Tabitha, which translated means Dorcas. She was full of good works and acts of charity. In those days she became ill and died. And when they had washed her, they laid her in an upper room. Since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples, hearing that Peter was there, sent two men to him, urging him, Please come to us without delay. So Peter rose up and went with him. And when he arrived, they took him to the upper room. All the widows stood beside him weeping and showing tunics and other gardens, garments that Dorcas made while she was with them. So Tabitha dies or Dorcas dies. And what do the disciples do? They call Peter. They don't raise her from the dead. They're not doing signs and wonders here. They're not saying, 
Dorcas, in Jesus' name, we command you to get up. No, they called Peter, big A apostle. And as a matter of fact, when you go through the book of Acts, you see that it is mainly the apostles that are doing signs and wonders and those that the apostles had commissioned that are doing signs and wonders. It wasn't every single person in the entire church. Verse 40 of uh, chapter 9. But Peter put them all outside and knelt down and prayed. And turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up. So who's the one that raised Tabitha from the dead? It was Peter. The disciples sent for him. Why didn't they raise Tabitha from the dead if every single person in the church had that kind of power? Because they don't. Granted, there were spiritual gifts, but not everybody had the same spiritual gift. Valentin also mentioned, and he, as Jesus, said to them, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. All these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up serpents with their hands. And if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick, and they will recover. The only charismatics that follow uh, this passage consistently are the snake handling churches. That's it. Because you don't hear the NER folks saying that we need to handle snakes or drink deadly poison. But they do mention tongues. They do mention uh, healing the sick. And they do mention casting out demons. So they cherry pick what Christians should be doing. And they leave the ones that look a little kind of uh, controversial they, they, they put them aside. They don't talk much about those. Charismatic teachers also burden you about hearing the voice of God. Today I would like to talk to you concerning how to hear God's voice. I believe there's four types of voices every single person hears regularly. The first voice is your own voice. The second voice is God's voice. The third voice is the devil's voice. And the fourth voice is the voice of other people. Let me review that again. God's, other people's, your own and the devil's voice. The God we serve speaks today. Our God is not distant God who created this earth and then left this earth. He set it in motion and forgot us. Our God wants relationship and for Him to have a relationship, He has to communicate. And to communicate, we have to be able to hear His voice. Adam, God's created human being, our first ancestor and the first human being, did not have a physical book, but he still had the ability to hear the voice of God and he heard commandments of God. Of course, he disobeyed them. But the point being is that God created a man and God communicated His instructions to that man. And God made His will known by communicating it to a human being. I hear God's voice every single day. You just heard God's voice. You heard it while I was reading Scripture to you. That is God's voice. And God still communicates with us every single time we open up His Word and read it. He is communicating with us. He's speaking to us. Nowhere in Scripture are we saw, taught to seek after an inner voice, an audible voice, or any kind of uh, experience like that. We are told this in 2 Timothy 3, 16-17. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. So, notice what this passage says about Scripture. First thing it says, that it's breathed out or inspired by God. So, if it is breathed out by God, if it is inspired by God, it is God's holy word. The Spirit of God is always connected to the Word of God. When you open up the Scriptures, you are hearing the voice of God. When you read it, you're reading the very words of God. It is breathed out by God. It's profitable for teaching, 
It's profitable for reproof. It's profitable for correction. It's profitable for uh, training in righteousness. And what's the outcome? It makes one complete and equipped for not some good works, but for every good work. How often do you hear charismatic pastors and teachers expounding Scripture? They say that they love the Bible. They say that they, they, ele- they, they elevate God's Word, but they actually don't. They actually elevate experience over God's Word, and they do this all of the time. So where does the Bible tell us that we are to chase after God's voice apart from Scripture? Nowhere. (laughs) Nowhere. And then he says, the point is, this is Vlad saying, the point is, he gave instructions to that man, to Adam. And God made his will known by communicating it to a human being. Well, again, God has made his will known today as well. Through Scripture. By giving us his holy, complete, sufficient word. We don't need to be chasing after anything else. And using Adam's communication with God in the garden is a really bad example anyway. Of course, God did speak to Adam. He was the first human being. It was natural. It would have been natural for Adam to hear God's voice and even walk with God in the garden and talk with God and communicate with him that way. God's not going to write something down for him. But nowhere in the Bible is Adam used as an example for us to hear God's voice. But listen to what the Apostle Paul says about Adam. Romans 5.14 Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam who was a type of the one who was to come. And then 1 Corinthians 15, 22, For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. And then 15, or 1 Corinthians 15, 45, Thus it is written, The first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving being. Spirit, and that last Adam spoken there is Christ. Christ is a, a, a um, is the second Adam. So, how else do pastors, charismatic pastors, and teachers burden their people? They burden them with this whole idea that God has a dream for you. God has this wonderful plan for your life, but you, Christian, you have to be the one to find out what it is and then carry it out so that on the last day, when you stand before Christ, he won't say to you, I gave you, I had a dream for you, but you didn't fulfill it. I had a job for you to do, a task, an assignment, but you didn't look for it and you didn't fulfill it. It's your responsibility. The burden is upon you. Here's Paul Doherty. Let me tell you who God gave dreams to, because it might shock you. The dreamers that God used in the Bible were born in a manger. Some of them born the least likely in their family to succeed, born in very poor families. Some of them were placed in a basket and put on the Nile River, could have been killed. Some of the dreamers that God used were crazy men like Noah, who God said, I want you to build an ark when there's no rain going on. Some of the dreamers God used were were people like Esther, people like Joshua, a second guy in the ministry, not the one who started the ministry, but the guy who had to transition it. After Moses, God used people like Gideon and God used people like David, shepherd boys, the youngest in the family. God used people like Micah and Ezekiel and Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego and Peter and a bunch of ordinary guys to do extraordinary things. I said, God has a dream for you, sir. He has a dream for everybody. Dreaming's not just for rich people. Dreaming's not just for affluent people. Dreaming's not just for people born in functional families. Dreaming is for people like Isaac and Jacob who grew up in messed up dysfunctional families. People like Joseph who were betrayed by his brothers and lived in a prison and accused of crazy stuff. Dreaming is for everyone. Dreaming is for you. God has a dream for your life. 
He says in Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the dream I have for you. My dream is not of evil for your life, but it's of good. It's to give you hope and a future. God didn't place us on this earth on accident for an accident. He placed us on this earth on purpose for a purpose. So there's a good example of this whole idea that God has a dream for you. And uh, you just need to find out what that dream is. I'll put a good video that my good friend Steve Kozar did in the description about that very thing. This dream destiny burden that uh, so many pastors place um, on their people. He also added to Jeremiah 29, 11. Did you hear that? Jeremiah 29, 11 actually says that I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. But he said, I know the dreams I have for you, declares the Lord. I don't know any translation that says, I know the dreams for I know the dreams that I have for you, declares the Lord. And he was quoting from the NLT. So, um, then you have, unfortunately, you have somebody like Chris Hodges that will say this, watch. There are five different types of people in our auditoriums today at all of our churches. There's, there's the first type of person is someone who has no dream. You have none. So you have no dream, you have no vision for your life. And I'm not trying to be ugly, I'm not really a confrontational type of a preacher, but chances are if there's no dream, there, there may be no God inside of you. There, there may be no, you're not connected with the living God. Let me say it this way, you may not have faith in God. Because Hebrews 11 is very clear. It says that, that faith, when you have faith, it is the substance of things hoped for. As soon as you have faith in your heart and you get close to God, God is going to drop dreams inside of you. So Hodges makes that a salvation issue. What a burden, folks. And that is just not true. Do you want to hear, do you want to hear what God wants you to do? Because God has specific works for us as Christians to do. As a matter of fact, um, Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works for which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. But what are those works? Well, we can go to the book of Ephesians and we can see a specific list laid out there for us. This, these are the works that God has for us to do. Let's start in verse 22 and let's read through 24. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church's body, and is himself its Savior. Now as, Christ, now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. So wives, what is, your, what is the work that God has called you to do? Be submissive to your husbands. Now what about husbands? If you're a husband, God has a work for you to do as well. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that, he might be, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. So husbands, what is your job? It's to love your wife. It's laid out for you. What about children? Ephesians 6 1 says this children obey your parents in the Lord for this is right so God even has work for children to do they're to be obedient Christ isn't laying all these crazy heavy burdens on us saying I got something for you to do but you better find out what it is I've got this dream but it's your responsibility to find out what this dream is I've got this great plan for your life this great assignment for you but it's your responsibility to find out what that assignment is, what that plan is, what that dream is, what that job is. No, he doesn't do that at all. And Paul, listen to what else Paul says. Ephesians 6, 5 through 9. Bond servants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart as you would Christ, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bondservant or is free. Masters, do the same to them, and stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and that there is no partiality with him. So masters and bondservants here, in today's world, we could say employee, employer. 
whatever God, job God has called you to do in your vocation, whether it's a truck driver, whether it's a store clerk, whether it's a restaurant worker, a waitress, whether it's no matter what it is, you're to do that and you're to obey the authority within that workplace. You're to do that in good conscience. You're to be a good employee. And you employers, you bosses, you're to be good bosses. You're to treat your employees with fairness. God's not laying this great big heavy burden on you folks saying, oh, you better find out what I'm, I want you to do. He gives a, he, he sums it up in a beautiful way in Colossians chapter 3, verses 18 through 24. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. Bond servants, obey in everything. Those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ in your vocation, whatever you are doing in your as a father. You, if you're a father, you're called to be a father. You're called to be a good father. If you're a, a mother, you're called to be a mother. You're to be a good and godly mother. You're to raise your children in a godly home. That's a, man, that is a high and holy calling. Fathers, again, you're to treat your children. You're not to exasperate them. Um, employer, employee, a relationship here again, you, you know, we can look at, uh, compare that with the bond servant and master relationship. So, Whatever we are doing, whatever a, a, a vocation God has called us to, we are to work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. So relax. God has called you to mundane tasks sometimes. Sometimes we don't like going into work. Sometimes we don't like, you know, doing the job that we do every day. It's a daily grind, but that's what God has called us to do. And that's a good thing and a pleasing thing to God because we are in the faith. And because we are Christians, because God sees us as righteous, every vocation God calls us to is a high and holy calling. Here's Chas Stevenson. Listen, if you don't know how to walk in love, you need to get saved. If you're not walking in love, you need to get saved. You get saved, the Holy Spirit will shed abroad the love of God in your heart. Amen. But you got to really mean it. You got to really know it. You got to really believe that you're saved and you'll have the love of God in here. And if you want that love of God to start coming out a lot easier, you need to pray in tongues. Praying in tongues helps the love of God come out. Build up yourselves in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Praying in the Spirit, praying in tongues keeps yourself in the love of God. How many of you have heard me say this before? How many of you have heard me say this over and over and over again? How many of you wish I would stop saying it? No, oh, because it is the secret to a loving, compassionate lifestyle that if you're not praying in tongues, you're not going to walk in love properly. And if you're, some of you, I don't know how to pray in tongues. Well, you need to come up and get filled with the Holy Spirit. You get filled with the Holy Spirit, you'll have some tongues. You need to start praying in tongues 30 minutes a day, an hour a day, however much you can a day. And you'll see things change in your life. You'll see that the identity that you have of yourself is in Christ. You'll start seeing the Bible come alive to you. If you'll pray in tongues, you'll see scriptures come alive to you. If you'll start praying in tongues, you'll be able to listen longer in church. So praying in tongues is the magic pill that is going to help you live the Christian life. And yet... We just read those passages in Ephesians and Colossians about living the Christian life and what living the Christian life looks like, and nothing in there about praying in tongues. If that if praying in tongues was going to give you power to live the Christian life, Paul and the other apostles would have certainly added that to the teaching on sanctification. Because that's what we just read. We just read those passages in Ephesians and Colossians having to do with sanctification. 
We are obeying Scripture when we are being godly husbands, godly fathers, godly mothers, godly wives, when we're being good and godly employees. And even earlier in chapter 5 in Ephesians, Paul says this about how Christians are to live. He says, therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among the saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. But according to Chas, every time I see that guy, I always think of Tim the Toolman Taylor. <laughs> so according to him, um, if you're not praying in tongues, you're not going to be able to do any of that. You're not going to be able to avoid sexual immorality or covetousness or any of the other commandments in Scripture. But it's ironic that Paul, that neither Paul nor Peter, when they give us instructions on how to live the Christian life, they never mention praying in tongues. No, that is, uh, that is something that pastors and teachers within the charismatic movement are doing to place you on, to place heavy burdens on you. Charismatic teachers also burden their people with saying, you need to prophesy because everyone can prophesy. Watch. Michael Maiden says all believers can prophesy. How can you be so certain? Well, first of all, the Bible says so in 1 Corinthians 14 that all can prophesy. And Joel prophesied about the Holy Spirit being poured out and sons and daughters and old men and young men, everybody, every generation can prophesy. It's part of God's great gifting to us through the Holy Spirit. Well, what is your experience when you teach people that have never heard such things? Like, um, give me an example when you teach as far as the, uh, the percentage of people that begin to prophesy. You know, the book of uh, 1 Corinthians 14 talks about, it says, pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, and especially the gift of prophecy. So I teach on that, and then we have people pray for each other, and I've done this around the world so many times, and 85, 90% of people feel like they've heard from God and give someone a prophecy. 85 to 90% of people feel that they hear from God and give a prophecy. Folks, that man is teaching people to be false prophets because every single person who prophesies is a prophet, and Paul says that, and I'll show that to you in just a moment. If you call yourself a prophet or if you prophesy to someone, you better be 100% correct. Otherwise, you're a false prophet. God pronounces huge judgment on those who take his name in vain by blaspheming him through false prophecy. So let's look at that passage or that verse that he took way out of context, 1 Corinthians 14.31. We're going to put it back in its context. This is what it says starting in verse 26. What then, brothers, when you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Let all things be done for building up. If any speak in a tongue, if any speak in a tongue, let there be only two, or at the most three, and each in turn, and someone, and let someone interpret. But if there is no one to interpret, let each of them keep silent in the church and speak to himself and to God. Now look at this. Let two or three prophets speak. And let the others weigh what is said. If a revelation is made to one to another sitting there, let the first be silent. Let the first two, the first prophet, the one who is prophesying. For you can all prophesy one by one. He's talking to the prophets. You can all prophesy one by one. He's not talking about every person in the church here. 
so that all may learn and all be encouraged. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. And that's the point of the passage. Paul calls those who are prophesying in the church prophets. Let two or three prophets speak. So that, it's, it's, it's very sneaky what they do. They, they, they can't really read that verse in its context because it would debunk their entire argument. So if you find yourself on that hamster wheel, constantly looking for signs and wonders to, to know whether God is actually working in your life or to know whether or not you are actually pleasing God or whether to know or not you're actually even a Christian, I got some good news for you. You can get off that hamster wheel because Christ has already done the work for you. He has bled and died for your sins and then rose again for you. I want to read a quote from uh, Fra Francis Pieper's Christian Dogmatics. Francis Pieper was a confessional Lutheran theologian. This is what he says. The term grace denotes God's gracious disposition for which which for Christ's sake he cherishes in himself towards sinful mankind, and by which he in his heart, before the inner forum, does not charge men with their sins, but forgives them. This gracious disposition of God is declared and certified unto men in the gospel, with the intent that they should believe it. And then he quotes Luther. Grace in the proper sense of the term denotes God's favor and good will toward us, which he cherishes, cherishes in himself. God's disposition towards you is one of grace and mercy. He longs to show you forgiveness. He longs to show you mercy. He longs to give you grace. And it's not because of anything within yourself. It's because of what Christ has done for you. Bleeding and dying on the cross, paying the penalty for your sins, absorbing all of God's wrath that you deserve in himself, taking all of the punishment as your substitute on your behalf, and then rising from the dead for you. Everything was done for you. And then, on top of it all, crediting the righteousness of Christ to your account so that Christ's righteousness, his works, become yours. And it's all for free. And that's the beautiful thing. I want to read something that C.F.W. Walther wrote in his book, uh, All Glory to God. And this is what it says. Walther says, if I were to take something not given to me, and not intended for my ownership, this would be wrong. I would be a thief. But forgiveness of sins, righteousness, life, and salvation, these divine gifts are not only offered to us as a kind of negotiable goods, but are freely given and bestowed. Therefore, Luther says, do you want to use these great blessings? Very well. He has already given them to you. Only do him the honor of accepting them with gratitude. I love that illustration that Walther uses there of a thief. If I were to take something that doesn't belong to me, I would be a thief. It would be wrong. But Christ has already given me everything. He's already won my salvation. He's already won my freedom by his death on the cross and his resurrection. Christ has already won it all for me. Therefore, I can just reach out and take it. You can just reach out and take it. It's already yours. You're not a thief. It's yours. It's a gift. All of it is gift. I'm going to read one more quote by Walther. And this is what he says. God, acting entirely alone, has made provision that man might be justified. According to his unfathomable mercy, he sent his only begotten son into the world, laid on him the sins of the whole world and punish them in him. So there is no sin, be it ever so great, that has been ex ex uh, expiated, whether it has already been committed or will still 
be committed. Christ has borne all of them, felt them, and has been punished for all of them. But he also kept the law perfectly, even though he was not obligated to do so. He did not lead a pious life because it is the essence, because it is of the essence of human life to be pious. Much rather, he stood far above the law as its giver and Lord. But for us, he fulfilled the law perfectly. So the righteousness of God was acquired for us. It is finished. It is here. Whoever does not believe or teach this robs God of his glory. Whoever thinks he must still do even a little for his justification takes honor for himself. Where do I find Christ's righteousness? Where is it? The dear God has not said, It has been won. Now see to it yourself that you acquire it. Neither has he said, Pray, fight, wrestle until you notice that you have it. No, it is already yours. It's done. Take what's yours. Believe the gospel. Believe what Christ has done for you. That's what's going to get you off the hamster wheel. And look to Christ whenever you do fall, because we are all going to struggle with sin in the Christian life. Yes, we are, as Christians, to live as Christ-like as we possibly can, and God has given us instructions in His Word on how to live a godly life, and we're to strive for that. But we're going to fall, and we're going to fail, because we still have this indwelling sin. We still have sin living within us, and it's a very difficult thing sometimes to get under control. But when you do find yourself in that predicament, look to Christ. Don't look to signs and wonders. Don't get back on that hamster wheel. Look to Jesus and his finished work on your behalf. Thanks for watching.